Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Standish Congregational Church on Worldwide Communion Sunday. We're so glad to have you with us in person and also online. Hello to the online people. Uh, joining us online today, as we don't have the pictures up front to see, are um, John and Lynn Johnston, Joyce Milliken, Marge and Jim Pendleton, the Pollard family, and the others are various views of the congregation. So um, welcome to all of you online um, and all of you in person. I also want to acknowledge that this is our reader Susan Albert's first time in person since we 
had to stop meeting in person because Susan has a camp and was away at camp watching us on Zoom all summer. I also want to acknowledge Sawyer and Amelia being acolytes today. Thank you so much. And so now let's join our hearts together as we embark upon worship. Please join Susan and me in the call to worship. Imagine a day when Christians all over the world set aside our differences and share what we have in common, a desire to know God and follow Jesus' example. Imagine a day when Christians the world over share a communion meal of bread and wine or juice together. Rejoice then, for today is that day. Today we celebrate Worldwide Communion Sunday with followers of Jesus around the world. Praise, Praise be to God. God. Amen. So there are going to be some international elements in the service today, breads from around the world, some different languages. Our opening hymn, Sia Hamba, the first verse is, if I remember correctly, in Zulu. Most of us know this pretty much by heart, but please just follow Bill's lead as we sing into our face masks. So, me, the first verse is uh, Jewel. Yes, yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. yeah. One that most of us know. Yeah. First one in Zulu, second one in English. I think most of us know the Zulu as well. I was better than our people. <laughs> Please stand. If you're planning to sing, please stand. We're, we're a little rusty at this. Yeah. Drop the mic. to sing again. So we do have a few announcements today. I'll keep the ones I'm offering as brief as possible. I uh, especially want to draw your attention to announcements about the Village Square Fair. Uh, bottom line for crafts, see Kimber Cross. Raise your hand, please, Kim. For cookies, please see Allison Crawford. And for crafts, the deadline for dropping them off is October 31st due to the need to photograph them on for online sales. Right, Kim? Okay. All right. Does anyone else who's not scheduled to speak have an announcement? Cheryl. Oh, this has to do with the fair. I, again, I'm, I'm going to be uh, setting up the jelly. Uh, and I'm going to put out a, um, a spreadsheet on, on um, Google, and uh, so people can tell me what they're making, so it's going to be 
All right, see Cheryl, if you're doing jams or jellies, does that also include pickles and things like that? Yeah, pickles and jellies. Any, anything in a jar, right? <laughs> okay, thank you. Mary Lou. Um, so this came up last week, um, the Sunday School Collection for World Food Day, where we think about uh, hunger, you know, in terms of the globally, and in support of our we sang a little song last week asking for um, corn, jam, and spaghetti sauce. So if you think to bring it in next week, we'll be back in the right room in the lab. Thank you. Next Sunday is World Food Sunday. We are collecting food for the food pantry. Mary Lou just said, please, um, if you can, bring corn, spaghetti sauce, or jam. Yeah. OK. Great. All right. So, um, Katie Marles would like to speak with you about choir. You, use the mic, please. Hi. Um, I just want to mention that choir, we're trying to resume choir. Um, I don't want to take anybody out of their comfort zones because of the COVID to do that. But I feel like everyone wanted to move away from um, doing remote singing and making videos and all of that. So I just want to be sensitive to what everybody is looking for in a choir and, and what that means to everybody. So um, feel free to come to me or to Cynthia or um, you know, to someone that will pass it on to me. If, if you want to change something about a choir, if you want to add something to the choir, if you want to put more people in the choir, um, that'd be great. I just, I, I don't know how to move forward from this place um, as do any of us. <laughs> so, um, but it's been on Dean's plate for a long time, and I mentioned to her taking a Sunday off, and, and Bill is here to cover her for that, and Dave today too. So, um, um, but, and I picked Monday night, which I know is a terrible night of the week, but it was the one day that I didn't have stuff going on. So if it's the night, that's a problem too, please speak up and, and throw out a different day too. Um, I just want to be sensitive to what everyone's looking for and, and help kind of make what we can out with stuff. Thanks so much, Katie. So to um, briefly summarize, uh, Katie is looking to start the choir back up. Um, if people are feeling comfortable about participating, if you've ever sung in a choir and would like to try again, this would be a great time to do that. And that includes the people who have come to us from the Caressy Road Church. We don't really know who sang in that choir, but if you did, and if you feel comfortable about coming to choir practice, I think um, masks are being used for singing, I think. Yeah. Um, anyway, I know Katie is very sensitive to sensitivities around COVID, so I'm sure whatever works will be worked out. But um, it would be great if you would like to come and sing with Katie, Bill, Jean, and anyone else who comes. So Monday evenings at 7 p.m., unless we hear otherwise from, from Katie. And thank you so much, Katie. You're doing a wonderful job as our Minister of Music. Next announcement is from Susan Albert, who's the chairperson of the Missions Board. This is about our Neighbors in Need offering. Good morning. Um, as Cynthia said, this is our Neighbors in Need offering time. Every year they have a theme. The theme this year seems to be homelessness, which is rather important during the times we're in. Neighbors in Need is the UCC's annual offering to support ministries of justice and compassion throughout the United States, including the Council for American Indian Ministries, CANE. Justice and advocacy efforts and direct service projects funded by the UCC's Justice and Witness Ministries. 
We will receive this offering on October 24th, and it supports the UCC's Ministries of Justice and Compassion. Two-thirds of the offering is used by the UCC's Justice and Witness Ministries to fund a wide array of local and national justice initiatives, advocacy efforts, and direct service projects. Our National Justice Witness Ministries offers resources, news updates, and action alerts on a broad spectrum of justice issues. Working with members of the UCC Justice and Peace Action Network, Justice and Witness continues its strong policy advocacy work on issues such as the federal budget, voting rights, immigration, health care, hate crimes, civil liberties, and environmental justice. Neighbors in Need also supports our American Indian neighbors in the UCC. One third of the offering supports the UCC's Council for American Indian Ministries came. Historically, forebears of the UCC established churches and worked with Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, Mandan, Hidatsa, Arikara, and Hohag in North and South Dakota and Northern Nebraska. Today, there are 200 UCC congregations on reservations and one urban multi-tribal UCC congregation in Minneapolis, Minnesota. These churches and their pastors are supported by Kane. Kane is also an invaluable resource for more than 1,000 individuals from dozens of other tribes and nations who are members of other UCC congregations in the United States. Neighbors in Need helps make unfailing love possible. For this to occur, it needs your support. Thank you. Again, the offering will be accepted on October 24th. Thanks so much, Susan. And now, please join me in the opening prayer printed in your bulletin. Holy mystery, protector of the faithful, glorious spirit of wonder, bread of heaven, you have made us a little lower than the angels and crowned us with glory and honor. You have called us to be your witnesses, to proclaim the good news in good times and in bad. Sanctify us and help us see ourselves in you the living body of the risen Christ, broken and poured out to feed a hungry world. Amen. Today's anthem, Bread of the World in Mercy Broken, I believe will be sung by Bill Tracy and Dave Heath. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Thanks so much, Bill and Dave. That was beautiful. And now I'd like to invite Miss Mary Lou and the young people to the communion table. We just need to move a mic stand and a mic so that we can all be heard. Good to see you, Sawyer and Amelia. I want to talk about different things. Our world today often seems overcome by violence and broken relationships. It often feels like it's impossible for people to overlook their differences and share a new way of being together. Can you think of an example? Where people are not overcoming their differences, they're not finding a way to be someone, let's just say someone does something and someone gets mad and then they hit them. All right, that's or like right. wars. Wars, yeah, I was thinking of the Congress, but yes. <laughs> uh, we want to um, overlook our differences and find new ways of being together. At times, this brokenness is also reflected in the Christian church. Even though Christ called us to be in one body, to be one body we worship in separate denominations and uh, stick to differing theological views and worship traditions. Fortunately, many people of faith continue to find ways to help us build bridges toward one another. Worldwide Communion Sunday is one such opportunity. On this Sunday, Christians from all around the world, all nations, races, and customs are uh, receiving communion and celebrating their membership in a worldwide Christian family circle. This is one of my favorite Sundays because I love that idea of everybody doing the same thing at the same time. And to symbolize this, we have breads from different worlds, which we will now reveal. You can hold it up, Amelia, so everybody can see. So, this is tortilla from Mexico and a baguette from France. This is pita bread, and this is from Israel. And this is naan. Where is this from? India. India. Thank you for helping us find ways to work together. Thank you. Thank stand and light these great friends. I want to make sure that they 
online participants can hear. Um, is there a way of finding that out? Testing, testing. On the night that Jesus was betrayed. About to start the sacrament of communion. Can you hear? We still have some folks who work out technology, but we are getting better. So, could the online participants here a minute ago raise, uh, wave your hand if you could hear? Okay, apparently not. <clears throat> Okay, can you hear me now, online participants? Okay, excellent. Sorry for the delay and the awkwardness. I just want to make sure we're all together. We are in person and online. We are still one congregation, and that's very important to remember on Communion Sunday. Um, on Worldwide Communion Sunday, we're also very cognizant that we partake of this holy meal in company with Christians all over the world, and also Christians throughout eternity who are a part of that great cloud of witnesses that the book of Hebrews refers to. In our tradition, in the United Church of Christ, we practice open communion, so everyone is welcome to participate with us, whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey you are welcome to participate. So would you now please join me in the communion prayer. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give thanks to you, O God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Therefore, the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we love and magnify your glorious name, and we're praising you to the same. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. O holy God, creator of all people and worlds, send now upon this bread and cup and all the breads that have been brought today, send now upon these elements your Holy Spirit. As we partake of this holy meal, fill us with the Holy Spirit that we may be one body and one spirit in Christ. All glory and honor is yours, almighty God, forever and ever. Amen. Now, just a word of explanation. We are using these fellowship cups. So to try to do this in sync, let's everyone Take the lid off and take a moment to see what these 
see what we have here. So we have the juice in a little cup, and we have the bread cleverly folded into the pot. So please get out your bread. And I'm actually going to use this nice baguette, baguette to show breaking the bread. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body given for you. As often as you eat this, remember me. Okay, so hang on for a minute for the cup. After supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for you and shed for everyone so that sins may be forgiven as often as you drink this remember me the gifts of god for the people of god eat drink and be thankful And would you now please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. We give you thanks, O oh God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn for all ages is Jesus Loves Me. I'm going to ask everyone to sing into your face masks. Please sing the, the first verse of Jesus Loves Me twice, and I have to go and find something. I'll be right back, so please just go ahead. to try to sing what I remember of the Spanish. I've lost my um, cheat sheet. Okay. Oh, thank God. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, how embarrassing. I don't even know what's in the bulletin that I prepared myself. I guess I'm just a little nervous about singing in front of you and singing in Spanish and singing a note that's too high for me. But with all that said, this contributes to the worldwide flavor of the service, or at least I hope it does. So Katie, would you play the last line again and I will launch forth. Mm -hmm. 
for those who joined in. That was very helpful. Excuse the vocalist's um, high notes, and um, thanks for listening. Oh, yes, thanks, Katie. So our focal scripture passage today is from the Gospel of Mark. And it's another passage out of many passages where Jesus says some things that um, seem unusual or in some ways turns the usual order of things upside down. Uh, this passage certainly has something to do with what um, were called family values in, uh, you know, a lot of things we heard a few years ago, family values was quite a buzzword. So in this passage, Jesus is talking about marriage, divorce, and children. And so please listen as Susan reads for us. I'm reading from Mark. 10 verses 1 through 16. He left that place and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds again gathered around him. As was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came, and to test him, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband, and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms and laid his hands on them and blesses them. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Susan. Please join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Jesus' family values. Well, when we use that phrase, we have to 
that I preached on a few weeks ago where Jesus's mother and brothers and sister came to the house where he was staying and tried to take him away because they thought he was crazy. And I wonder if you remember my preaching on that. I won't ask for a show of hands. Uh, perhaps some of you do. Um, in any event, <clears throat> they came to the house where Jesus was, was staying and tried to uh, drag him away and um, bring him home and take care of him because they thought he was crazy. You know, he was going around healing people and teaching people and saying things that surprised people and that flew in the face of religious authorities and he was following God's call and as is true for many who believe they are following God's call the people who used to know them don't always understand so in the context of that passage uh, one of Jesus's friends comes to him and says your mother and brothers and sisters are outside waiting for you and he says those who do do the will of God are my mother and brothers and sisters so the first thing to remember about Jesus's family values is that everyone that does the will of God is part of his family and I think in our belief we would say everyone in the world is a beloved child of God and potentially we are all members of Jesus's family but this passage is specifically about marriage divorce and children and it is so off as is so often the case especially in the gospel of mark a group of pharisees joins a crowd that has come to hear jesus teach and they are trying to trip him up and they ask him what they think is a trick question according to one of the commentators i read the Greek word, and I did not write it down, I don't remember the exact word, but the Greek word for test really means something more like pop quiz. So the Pharisees give Jesus a pop quiz, and they ask him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now notice the specific details there. Lawful man divorcing his wife. Um, nothing about whether women can divorce their husbands. Jesus turns that question back upon them and says, what did Moses command you? Because the Pharisees had a very good command of Moses' commandments. And they answer, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. And they are alluding to Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4, which allows for a man to divorce a woman simply because he finds something objectionable about her. And so Jesus responds to the Pharisees. Jesus, uh, he says, Moses did this because of your hardness of heart. And he goes on to quote words from the creation story. God made hum humankind male and female. And it goes on to say, the two shall become one flesh. What God has joined together, let no one separate. Now, I think we need to pause for a moment and think about what Jesus is not saying here. Um, this passage gets used in a lot of ways, some of which I would consider inappropriate. And one of those ways is to bash divorced people and to say they are going to hell. In fact, another commentary I read was by a pastor who said early in his pastorate, when he had just come to a church, um, a woman in the church came up to him and said, my son has just gotten a divorce. Is he going to hell, pastor? So you know, talk about a pop quiz. So the pastor had to think of an answer and figure out what to say. And I think he basically said, uh, no, of course, 
of course, your divorce son is not going to hell because of that. So <clears throat> Jesus is definitely not saying divorced people are going to hell or divorced people are not beloved children of, of God. Um, he's also not saying that you, he's, not, he's also not saying that all divorce is wrong. Um, he is saying what God has joined together, let no one separate. He is saying the marriage vow should be taken very seriously. Um, in some settings, such as the Roman Catholic faith, marriage is actually a sacrament, and um, it helps to bind the married couple not only to each other and to God. And even though we don't call it a sacrament, I think that's very much what we believe when we have a wedding in church. Um, so the marriage vow is very serious, not to be put aside lightly. Um, as this passage goes, goes forward, um, we find out it is considered okay of unfaithfulness. So a man may divorce his wife if she has been unfaithful. Um, back then, it was much more common actually for men to be unfaithful. Not that there are statistics to prove that, but women were pretty much sequestered in the home and didn't have that much chance to get out. Um, and furthermore, um, they, were not, they were not allowed to divorce their husbands. It was always initiated by the man. Um, so, Again, Jesus is saying the marriage vow is very serious. Uh, God has joined these people together. Um, and the bottom line is love. I think that really is the bottom line with everything Jesus teaches. Um, so in a marriage, the overall point is it's all about love. And you don't reject your partner just because you find something objectionable about them. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I wonder if there's anyone here who has never found anything objectionable about your spouse. <laughs> or, conversely, thinking about it the other way, is there anyone who knows their spouse has never found anything objectionable about them? <laughs> I know in my own very happy marriage, Ray and I, would both have had to admit that, yes, there were some objectionable things here and there that we had to um, tolerate. So <clears throat> Moses allowed a man to give his wife a bill of divorcement, as the Old Testament put it, a certificate of dismissal um, to divorce her. And by the way, the, the certificate was important because the ancient Hebrew culture, in fact, ancient culture in general, uh, women without men were really pretty much in danger. They were in danger of starvation. They were in danger of being forced into prostitution, uh, things like that. It's a lot like um, fundamentalist Islamic culture today the status of women in fundamentalist Islamic culture today. Um, they need to have a male escort everywhere they go. Um, they need to be in a man's home, part of a man's family, to be safe. Um, thankfully, that is not true, in, not, not true in our world. So <clears throat> moving along, Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her, i.e. his first wife. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Now this is the first time in the Bible that any mention has been made of a woman divorcing a man. So it's interesting that Jesus puts that in the, uh, his, uh, his discourse here. The rules are the same for both. Whoever divorces their spouse, especially if it's just only about something objectionable, um, is, doing, is doing an injustice. And I've 
need to finish what I was saying about the certificate of dismissal. Um, the woman needed to have the certificate of dismissal to show that she had been married. She, she wasn't just running away from home. So, it, it, you know, that much did help her in the future. So Jesus acknowledges that both men and women may divorce one another and that either may commit adultery through remarriage. But again, I really don't think that what we're supposed to take away from this is literally about adultery and, un, you know, that kind of unfaithfulness. I think the main point is in, in, within marriage to be faithful in every way, not just sexually. So in the marriage ceremony, um, you promise to love one another in all kinds of circumstances. Um, when Ray and I married in 2000, we plighted our troth because we were people who loved old fashioned English. We plighted our troth to you know, love one another until death do us part. Um, but all of that, you, you make those promises when you're married, but there are all kinds of ways of being unfaithful, as I think all married people are well aware. And when a marriage gets really bad, the problems are about one partner being abusive. That is a huge form of unfaithfulness that goes against love one another, you know, promise to love one another through good times and bad. If one person is being abusive, um, that is unfaithful. Uh, Jesus doesn't say that, but I think we can infer that since love was Jesus's bottom line, um, that is what he, what he meant. Now, one more thing to say about what this passage is not about. Since, it's, since the wording of the passage is very specific about men and women marrying each other, men and women cleaving to one another and being one flesh, this passage has been used in some circles to bash same-sex marriage. Now, I know there's a range of perspectives in our church about same-sex marriage, or at least I assume there's a range of perspectives. But we are an open and affirming congregation, and we have made the decision to treat church members of people who come to our church, no matter what their orientation is, um, treat them the same as everyone else. And I have come to believe in that whole way of viewing the world. And so I think a takeaway from this passage, even though it's absolutely not about same-sex marriage at all, um, maybe in a way it is because the same principle of being faithful to the person you have made a commitment to applies no matter what your sexual orientation. So if you're in a committed partnership um, with someone of the same sex, then I think Jesus' words about not putting your partner aside just because, you know, for, just because you want to, uh, would still apply. Being faithful to your commitments, being loving. So <clears throat> this whole discourse about marriage and divorce, it shows a concern for the women of Jesus' time who had no rights except, uh, or, or very few rights, except um, what the men in their lives gave them, and no right to divorce their husbands. So Jesus kind of points to that, and he's trying to, and, and along with love, it's about justice. And in the next scene, the, 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 the part about the children coming to Jesus, it's also about justice. In Jesus' time, just as is the case in some parts of the world today, um, children were basically seen as commodities. Um, you know, that's an oversimplification, I'm sure, but that is what some of the commentary, the way some of the commentaries put it. 
Uh, so basically the value of a child in a family was to help with feeding the family, bottom line, um, helping to support the family. So as soon as they were old enough, they started helping with the family work. Um, another factor, of course, was um, a lot of small children died very young, and this remained true until about a century, a couple of centuries ago um, in, the, in the first world, that a lot of children died very young. And so in both the ancient and medieval world, in families, uh, parents did not want to get too attached to their children when they were very young because of the likelihood that the kids could die. Um, but what I was really getting at here is that children are at the bottom of the social hierarchy in Jesus' time. And that is why the disciples are trying to keep them away from Jesus and treating them as just pests. So Jesus being Jesus is pointing out children are not pests. Children are beloved by God. And for that matter, people, you could learn a lot from children about your relationship with God because um, they have open hearts and they just accept God's love. And um, so they're welcome in the kingdom of God. Don't try to keep them away from me, uh, Jesus says. So, um, I think one of the takeaways for us in the story about children is a reminder of what a blessing it is to have children in church. Today we have uh, Sawyer and Amelia, we're so glad they're here. Um, we all know that children in our congregation are in short supply, and it's not just our congregation. All of my colleagues in the UCC in smaller churches have three to five children, if, if that many. Um, there are factors in the world out there that are taking children away from church. I think you're well aware of, of them, but I'll name two of them, sports and scouting. Not to say anything bad about either one. They're both very, very good things, but both sports and scouting schedule important events on Sundays when there is Sunday school and church. And families have to make horribly difficult decisions about where are the children going to go and what's best for the children. And so, you know, I'm aware of that. But that is one thing that is keeping children from us. Perhaps another thing is something we're doing or not doing, and we'll have to figure that out, whatever it is or isn't. We certainly are trying to keep our Sunday school program up and running, but I think one of the things that has gotten in the way of children in our congregation in the past was <clears throat> thinking the children had to behave in a certain way to be worthy of being in church. Children had to be quiet. Children couldn't run around. I think it was about six years ago that we had quite a few discussions in various settings at church about, I remember, at least I kept insisting, having children in church is a blessing. It's okay if children make noise in church. It's okay if children are running around in church. Let's give thanks that they are here. So some of those old rules about how children were supposed to behave in church were a bit like the disciples trying to keep the children away from Jesus. But I think the overall point in the context of the Gospel of Mark is children were at the bottom of the social hierarchy. Jesus is turning that upside down and saying how important children are in the kingdom of God. So Jesus' family values, everyone is welcome in Jesus' family. Thanks be to God and amen. And thank you for listening. And we now come to the time in our service where we share before God and one another our joys and our concerns. 
um, who has something to share today. Uh, let me start with the people online so that I make sure not to forget that. Does anyone joining us online uh, have something to share today? All right, I'm just glad you're here, online people. Um, In-person people, what do you have to share today? Susan. I have a friend, a former co-worker, who is um, having some serious medical issues. He had unregulated diabetes, unbeknownst to him, that has resulted in an amputation of the foot. His heart is struggling, he needs bypass surgery, and isn't able to have that yet until they take care of the food. He's a, a lovely man. He's got five children. He has a job, and this has just thrown that whole family upside down. His name is Ralph DeJardins. Ralph DeJardins. Okay. Um, let me know if you want to put his name on the I prayer really list. Like that. Okay. So <clears throat> prayers for Susan's former colleague and friend, Ralph DeJardins, who has multiple health concerns. We want to remember Norma Roberts in prayer. If I remember correctly, she was facing surgery in a few days. And what else? Eric. So I have a joy, uh, simple things, uh, bike ride. So yesterday I had a great opportunity to take a bunch of youth out on a bike ride through Standish and Norham down to Gambo Field. And uh, all told, we did about 20 miles of riding. And at the beginning, I looked at all the boys and, uh, and girls and said, uh, how long do you think you want to go for? They were very hesitant to say the distance. They said, well, we'll try a couple miles. And uh, as we went through, we just couldn't get them to stop. Maybe it was because we got a little lost. But <laughs> at, at the end of it, I, I, we all made it. And I said, how do you feel? They were like, I didn't think we could do it, but we did. We had fun. Can we go again? And it just goes to show that sometimes you just get out there and enjoy the simple things, and it's really joy. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, Eric is sharing as a joy about a bike ride that he took some youth on yesterday, and how much everyone enjoyed it, even though in the beginning they didn't think they could do it. Anyone else? Joys or concerns? All right, well, I'm going to share something. The flowers on the altar today are there for the glory of God and in memory of my dearly beloved husband, Raymond Bigger, who died six years ago this past week. So um, I give thanks for Ray. So uh, let's take a moment then for some silence and then uh, we will have our, I will say the pastoral prayer. Let's be in the spirit of prayer together. Gracious and loving God, on this Worldwide Communion Sunday, we give thanks for that communion of saints, that great cloud of witnesses, both still living and having gone to be with you, who have been witnesses to the faith and who still inspire us. We give thanks for the chance to think about doing communion with people all over the world. And so we lift up as a joy that, that there still is a worldwide church. There are many points of disagreement among churches and denominations, but also many, many points where we all feel that we are worshiping the same God and following the same faith, at least in its basic details. And for Christians, that includes the practice of communion. We give thanks for reminders 
that your kingdom, dear God, is open to everyone and that we are all beloved children of God and also that Jesus said, let the children come to me. He did not want anything to get in the way of that. And we pray, dear God, that if we as a church are doing something to get in the way of children being part of our congregation, we ask that we may be able to identify it and put it aside. But we also realize that some of it is circumstances beyond our control, the way the world is today. And we ask you to help us continue our efforts to welcome children and people of all ages, people of all kinds uh, to this church. We do give thanks for this church and for all it means to everyone here. And as we go forward and the pandemic winds down, we pray for ways of reaching out and inviting the community in to be part of us. We pray for the joys and concerns of our hearts. So we give thanks today for experiences like Eric shared of taking some youth on a bike ride and everyone having such a good time. We all have things in our daily lives that bring us comfort and joy, things as simple as eating a fresh peach with our morning cereal. And so we give thanks for those kinds of joys. <clears throat> And we also open our hearts to you with concern. Today we pray for Norma, who is facing more surgery, and for Ralph with multiple health issues, and for others <clears throat> whose needs are on our hearts today. We pray for the Neighbors in Need offering in general, that it may help people around the world uh, that it's intended to help. We give thanks for the many blessings of our lives, dear God, and we ask you, as always, to lead and guide us individually and collectively. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come to the time of our offering, and as always, I thank everyone who has been faithful to support our church financially, and reminder that you can contribute your offering either in the offering plate here or mail it to Allison Crawford. So let's be in a spirit of meditation as Katie plays the offertory, uh, reflecting on how we will continue to do God's work in the world. Thank you. 
Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Gracious God, all that we have comes from you. With thankful hearts, we offer our gifts to you. Amen. Today's hymn of dedication is Let There Be Peace on Earth. I'm singing this lovely hymn. join me in the responsive benediction. The ground we stand on may be shaky, yet let us go forth on the solid ground of trust and faith. Life may seem disconnected and filled with uncertainty, yet let us go forth connected with God and with each other. The world may be hurting and forgetful of what really matters in life. So let us go forth and bring hope and healing and love to all God's children. And may the love of God, the grace of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.
service is over. I hope to see you again next week. Thank you for coming. Uh, for in-person people, please join us in the fellowship hall so that we can have a blessing and rededication. <laughs>